going to have a good time. We're going to learn some more things. I think there's some interesting things that we'll come across. I want to say it, uh, first off, um, no class next week, next Sunday, right? We got Thanksgiving, so that was a, a week that we built in, so uh, we want you to not be here, okay? Uh, we'll, we ought to schedule out this end sometime like at, toward the end of November. So we've got, uh, this week four, so we've got plenty more time. Uh, there's a good chance, as I mentioned on night one or two, there's a good chance that this continues on. In fact, I would say there's about a 100% chance that this continues on. Um, we might touch the fall feasts before, uh, before the Christmas break. We might not, but we'll definitely, definitely be done with, uh, with uh, our spring, spring feasts, okay? And, you know, I spent a lot of time, I know I spent a lot of time on the Passover. It seems like we haven't made prog- progress, but we have. Um, we mentioned Passover and unleavened bread. Uh-oh, my wife told me. Do not, do not play ring around the rosy around the pulpit. That's what she said. So I took a step there and I saw the glaring eyeballs. You don't see them and they won't be seen on YouTube, but I saw them. And so um, we, uh, it's, a, it's an important theme and we're going to tie, tie it all together. But unleavened bread and Passover, really, we're, in a sense, we're kind of into it. Premise is the first, uh, that's the French word, they premise, the first fruits um, is just is something we'll mostly mention just in passing. And then we'll, we'll spend the bulk of the rest of our time on uh, the Feast of Weeks, okay, which is, uh, which is another important one. If you remember we talked about it, um, it is one, another one of the pilgrim feasts. Um, how many of you are aware we just passed an important Jewish feast? What was it? Does anyone know? It was Rosh Hashanah, right? The, the trumpets, okay? If you look at your, your map there, uh, your chart, that goes all the way down to uh, October the, the 1st or right around then. Um, Rosh Hashanah, okay? And um, the Festival of Trumpets, and we're going to find out. It's actually it's the one we're waiting for. And uh, why are we waiting for it? Because we as believers are waiting, are we not, for the sound of the trumpet. And again, we'll be... Uh, especially, um, we've looked at some prophetic elements, but we'll be especially examining the prophetic elements that we see in the fall festivals because those are the ones that remain prophecy, right? We have fulfilled the Passover and we fulfilled the, and we're fulfilling as Christians in our daily life the eating of the unleavened bread of Christ. And um, <clears throat> so uh, those things are, uh, in a sense, They're related to our daily life, but they're also past events in the prophetic calendar. But those are the ones that are are to come, okay? Um, Let's pray, and then we're going to do a little bit of review, and then we're going to be discussing, uh, mostly tonight, we'll we'll take a look at the three Passovers of Christ that we see in the Scriptures. Father, thank you for your love and goodness. I thank you for each that's come tonight. And Lord, I pray that um, you would bless us through... Uh, the study of your word, Lord. I know there's a thousand other things that each person could do, and yet uh, they've chosen to come here. And so, Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless them, reward them, encourage them uh, for having made this decision, and, Lord, that you'd meet with us and that we would would see uh, more in the word of God about you, that you would reveal yourself uh, more fully, more deeply, more completely uh, to us. And I pray, Lord, that it would not just be something that is uh, helpful, enjoyable for us tonight, but help us to lay uh, some more um, bricks, some more stones into the foundation of our Christian life and our uh, our lifelong study of your precious word. So we, we ask again that you would bless our time and uh, give us just a, a good time uh, together and Lord with you in your word. We pray all of this in Jesus name. Amen. Again, we're talking about the spring festivals, Unleavened Bread and Passover. If you remember, we talked about the fact that they are uh, together, combined. They're called the Feast. Uh, and then we talk and we'll be talking as well uh, in coming weeks about the Feast of Weeks. Last week, we dealt with the Passover or the, the Pesach, and we looked at it from Exodus chapter 12. And we saw that what took place uh, on that evening, many thousands of years ago in Egypt, Uh, And we saw also what God had commanded his people to do in Exodus chapter 12, 
verses 12 and 13. And it was written, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And again, we said this, this feast is so relevant to our lives as Christians because you know, it is an important thing for us to understand. When, when, when God saves us, in a sense, he doesn't make us better, right? He saves us and he places us in Christ. And it's not like, you know, he looks down and he says, wow, that is such a much better, new and improved Pastor Hilmer. He's finally got this thing. No, he doesn't see me. He sees the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He sees the image of his son. And that's what's acceptable to him. Not, not what I've changed, not what I've become in Christ. Uh, truly, that's what Paul said, didn't he? In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And my friends, that doesn't change when we get saved in our flesh still. For the rest of our lives, as long as we're in this earthly tabernacle, there will be no good thing dwelling within it. But we have the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is pleased with his son. And so this is not just an event that happened thousands of years ago. This is something that is relevant to us today. And it will continue to be relevant until God takes us home. We understand that when we listen to music, right? I, I, how many of you like classical music? I like classical music. When you listen to classical music, say you're going to listen to, you know, a concerto or something like that, you, the, recurring through it is a theme, right? You hear that, you hear that theme. It'll, you know, it'll go off in some direction and play some things, and then they come back and then they replay the theme. Maybe, I don't even know the right words. Maybe in a different key? I, I don't know. What is that called, right? I mean, I have no idea. All right? I'm digging my, my ditch, right? I don't, I don't know what it's called, but you can hear the theme even though it doesn't sound maybe the same as it did earlier. When you read a poem, a lot of times a poem has a recurring theme, right? Or you read a book and there's themes that come up. You watch a movie and there's themes that come up. My friends, the scriptures, I like that. And it's important for us to not only understand the details, but we're to, we're to understand the themes that, 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 that go throughout the scriptures. And one of the themes that's found throughout the scriptures is the lamb, the shedding of the blood of the lamb and the, you know, the, 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 the freedom, the salvation that we get from that. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's important that we study the scriptures and grasp those themes. We examine that meal that they ate. And, and we said that they, they, they were to remember. We call that meal the Seder. They were to partake of the bitter herbs. And the bitter herbs were to remind them of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. They are to remind you and I of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Once more, uh, though salvation is free to you and I, it, it, it was not without cost. It cost the blood. It cost the very life of Jesus Christ. And, and, and something that I don't think that we always grasp. Probably, I mean, I, I don't think, you know, I was reading, I went to the nursing home today and I preached for the older people. And we, we looked at that verse in Romans 5, 8 where, you know, where it talks about Christ, you know, gave himself and for, for you know, in verse uh, 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 5, 7, he talks about that, you know, someone might even give themselves for a righteous person. But we know Jesus gave himself even for the enemies, right? Do we understand that probably the most significant of the sufferings of Jesus Christ to be, was to be separated from the Father? I don't know that we meditate upon that perhaps as often as we should. Sometimes we you know, we, we hear someone preach or teach and they're talking about those physical sufferings and I'm not minimizing them. They were horrifying. The mental anguish and the, you know, uh, the, the emotional anguish. I mean, to, 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 be, to be the humiliation. Okay, he, he that, wa that lived a life of, you know, complete uh, uh, modesty and purity to hang naked upon the cross publicly. The shame that was involved in all of that. But I think none of that really um, compares to that period of time, those several hours when Jesus was separated for the only time 
in all of eternity from his Father. And so the sufferings of Christ were to remember from those bitter herbs. And then they're also to serve for you and I as a reminder of our life before Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but you guys were talking about it before. If you were here today, you were humbled, were you not, by what Pastor Crow was sharing? We, we can trip in and fall into that woe is me, can we not? We have it really, really good. The, the worst here have it really good. <clears throat> and sometimes we can, as, it, as in the Psalms, Asaph, the Psalm of Asaph, I looked at the prosperity of the wicked. Lord, why, why do I? You know, why do these things come to me? Why don't I have that? Why, why are these people that don't even love you they don't even care about you, that mock you and, you know, and, and take your name in vain. Why does it seem like everything's so good for them? And, and we forget the, the bitter herbs that come with that, don't we? And we need to remember that. It's important that we do. And then they had the unleavened bread, which reminded them of the hastiness of their departure. They had no time to bake the bread. They had to get out of there. And it is a reminder to you and I as well of the sinlessness of our Savior. Unleavened bread. Leaven being the symbol in the scriptures of, you know, of impurity or, or sin. And the fact that with the unleavened bread, you and I are to eat of that unleavened bread daily. That he, is, he, is not only, he did not only save us and then you know, we could just do our thing for the rest of our life. We are, to, you know, we are to eat of him and to drink, you know, eat of his body and drink of his blood each and every day. And then we talked about the, the lamb, the lamb who represented Christ, our Passover. We saw, we saw through the scriptures the important thing. Not a bone was broken. <clears throat> and then we, of course, we know that his blood was shed for our sins and to provide our salvation. And then I thought it was interesting. I, I want you to turn with me to Leviticus chapter 4. If you're like me, you spend a lot of time in Leviticus. It really is an extraordinary book. It teaches us... Uh, you know, we think it's a book that told them, you know, what to do with the animals and how to chop them up and stuff. It's a book that teaches us how to keep ourselves right before God. There, there, there's, again, none of these things is just a book from the past that has no relevance. Everyone has relevance to us today. How do I maintain my fellowship with my God? We read from that Jewish site, if you remember I read this last week, on the individual level, dealing with the, the family coming together and eating the Passover, on the individual level, the Seder requires every participant to feel as though he or she personally left Egypt. And then we, we made application to that. And we said, in, in truth, again, we, we need to understand that you know, Jesus didn't pick us because we were good. The best of you, the best of you. Jesus didn't pick us because we were good. Because none of us was. There's none righteous. No, not one. The Christian must, on the individual level, understand his personal role in the death of Christ. We don't like to think about that. We like to think about all the goodies that come with being in Christ. But my friends, we individually are and were responsible for the death of Christ. And it's very interesting. When you look at Leviticus, look at with me in Leviticus chapter 4, and look at verse number 4, and look what they had to do. Okay? Lambs are like real cuddly, kind of cute little things, right? And he shall bring the bullock under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. You know what that gave them a sense of? <laughs> this innocent thing is dying because of what I did. They had to place their hand upon the animal that was about to be slain, and it served as identification. My friends, every one of us is responsible. We had a hand in it. The death of Jesus Christ. Your sins, my sins, sent him to the cross. And so they would eat of that Passover, and they understood this lamb gave itself for us, gave itself so that we could spread that blood upon the door, the doorpost, the lintel. 
And then this animal, you know, for me to maintain my fellowship uh, with God, I must slay this animal and uh, place my hand upon its head and identify with it, identify my responsibility. And we need to understand that. You know, we're not to be, you know, be all, you know, moping and just, you know, unhappy about it all the time. But we do, deep down inside, we need to keep that understanding alive and present. Because we can get, many of you have been saved a long time, and many of you a lot longer than me. And there's a danger, isn't there? There's a danger in sometimes thinking, we got this. Or, boy, I'm sure a lot better than I was. You know what? Praise the Lord if you're a lot better than you were. But the truth is, we're still sinners saved by grace and saved through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And then we, additionally, we, we examined, and I won't go into it, but we, we examined all the preparations that went into getting ready for, you know, the Passover in Jerusalem or all these different, different festivals that came during the year. And we saw the many different things that went on, and we also discussed some of the things that took place uh, in and around the temple on that evening. Now, what we really want to focus on tonight is the uh, individual Passovers. Okay, of course, Jesus was, uh, we believe, he was about 33 years old at his death. He did not uh, present himself to the nation until his 30th year. That was typic for, typic, I'm sorry. I don't know why the French keeps popping in my mind. It was typical. A priest began his ministry at 30 years of age. Jesus was, you know, the high, the high priest. He was a priest not after the order of Levi, but after the order of Melchizedek. He was a priest, and so he began his ministry at that age, and he ministered in that public uh, realm or phase for just about three years. And so he went through about three Passovers. And so we want to look at them individually and see some of the events. Some of them we've already looked at. We just want to see them perhaps from a different angle and also to uh, provide, you know, again, a structure for us as we as we read the Gospels. Again, I'm talking about, you know, themes can provide a structure for us as we read through a book. You know, every book has its own themes, but then there are themes that we can, we can see woven in, in and through the entire Scriptures. And so, if, if we, you know, again, we can approach the Gospels, uh, you know, individually uh, from a number of different angles, but one of them is, is, is to approach it through, you know, the feast, that calendar, particularly of those, of several, the several years of his public ministry. So we want to, uh, first of all, examine some, some of the background truths. And remember, Passover was one of these pilgrim feasts, and we have seen that every Jewish man was required to travel to Jerusalem to participate in these. I've mentioned this on several occasions, but I, but I can't emphasize it enough. We need to understand that Jesus Christ was a Jew, okay? Uh, sometimes we see these pictures, you know, he looks, he's got the law, he looks like, you know, looks like, um, uh, you, know, um, you know, General Custer, right? With the long, flowing, curly hair and the deep blue, piercing eyes. Jesus didn't look like that, okay? I mean, I don't know exactly what he looked like, but he didn't look like that, okay? Those are artistic renderings that really don't, you know, fit into uh, the historic thing. Now, I, I worked, uh, I had my bus route in Gary, Indiana, and I've been in a lot of uh, African Methodist Episcopal churches, and Jesus in every one of those is a black man, okay? Jesus was not a black man, okay? Uh, he was a Jewish male, and so, you know, he looked like a Jewish male would have looked at that period of time 2,000 years ago. But it's important for us to understand, uh, as a Jewish male, and according to the scriptures, Galatians chapter 4, verse number 4, he was made under the law to redeem that, that, them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And, and if we don't understand that and we don't, we don't take that into account as we study the scriptures, sometimes we're going to arrive at, erroneous interpretations, okay, about Jesus, what he was doing, or why he did something. We don't want to have the church until Jesus is gone, okay? He purchased it. He bought it. It was formed after him. Some people, oh, there was one in the wilderness, or they, you know, it was the disciples around. 
And we don't see the church until the coming of the Holy Spirit. That's what I believe. And so um, Jesus was a Jewish male, all right? He was born under the law, and he had to follow. And as Messiah, he not only had to follow, he had to completely follow and completely accomplish uh, every jot and tittle of the law. We mentioned also uh, on numerous occasions that every time there was one of these big festivals, one of these pilgrim festivals, that there was an anticipation among the people, uh, a, a, the word that came, a, a buzz, right? You know, when there's some fad or some excitement, some, you know, big event coming up, there's a buzz about it, right? That's, uh, you know, all of the, the, the promised land, and particularly Jerusalem, would just be buzzing with anticipation, waiting for this, this festival and all the celebration and things that would go along. But particularly, as we've seen, because they, they, they were, they're, they're convinced that he is going to appear uh, during one of these festivals. And Jesus, wisely, and, and I would say this to you and I as well, we need to use the buzz and we need to use the events that go on around us. Uh, Christmas, the world doesn't want to talk about Jesus, but Christmas, it's right there. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving is a wonderful time to, to bring Christ into a conversation. We need to, to seize these events and as you study through the scriptures, you see Jesus on numerous occasions would use the holidays or use the events. Remember he talked once, he said, you remember those people where that tower of Siloam, that tower fell and killed all those people? Everyone knew that. That was a great tragedy. Jesus brought that in. He used it as an illustration to preach. And so use the events, use the happenings, use the, the things that are going on around us as lead-ins to spiritual uh, conversations. And so Jesus used these occasions to, to speak about himself. He, he used these opportunities and never forget that these, these festivals, although they, you know, again, we talk about the fact that they were agricultural and they served to, you know, join the, you know, the nation, the Jewish people together. But the real purpose of them and the real purpose of everything that, that we do and everything that goes on in our lives is Jesus. He is to be the center. He is to be the focus. And these feasts were designed, they were instituted by God to point to this Messiah. Now, another thing that's important to realize is that although it seems like Jesus spent a lot of time in Jerusalem, he really did not. When we read the Gospels, it seems like there's, you know, a lot of the Gospels is taken up with him in Jerusalem. But most of his ministry took place outside of that, in Judea and Capernaum and elsewhere. But much of the narrative of the Gospels takes place in Jerusalem, Okay. Uh, particularly, you read, the, you read the book of John, there's you know, a huge part of the book of John, probably two-thirds of it. Uh, at least a third is that, we talked about that last week, right? Uh, it, it, you know, maybe, maybe close to half of it is just that last week, that, that week where he enters into Jerusalem, and then you know, it ends with his, his, his death, burial, and resurrection. So, um, you know, we could, we could get, you know, if, if we weren't you know, focusing, we get the idea that he was just always in Jerusalem, uh, because that's what the stories are all about. They're all, you know, that's the setting for most of them. But that's not really the case, okay? Most of the time his ministry was outside, and then he was coming to Jerusalem for these different festivals as he was required to do. Now, look with me, please. Let's look in John chapter 2. And we're going to look at this first uh, Passover. Okay, I'm going to use, we could, we could go elsewhere, but just for the sake of time. And, and, it, and it's also... Uh, the clarity of John, the clarity of John uh, presenting these festivals is really good. So we'll just use John, although we could definitely turn, turn elsewhere uh, for brevity's sake and clarity's sake. We'll mostly remain here. John chapter 2. <clears throat> and um, we find, we find in, in, beginning in verse number 13, we see, and the Jews Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, okay? And so, this was shortly after the wedding uh, at Cana, right? He goes to that wedding. It's his first, if you'll see that in uh, verse number 11, the uh, Bible tells us, the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. So, that just kind of gives you a, um, you know, a, a reference point to where we are 
Shortly after that, he is going to go to Jerusalem uh, for this first Passover of his public ministry, okay? And so uh, let's take a little bit of time and read down through here. And found, verse 14, in the temple, those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. Remember I talked about that last week, that people came from all over uh, the Roman Empire and even beyond. They had to come there and change their money into a currency that would have been accepted uh, for them to give offerings and to purchase their sacrifices. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the charger, uh, changer's money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in the building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Now again, these activities, these actions, this, this story of turning over the money changers table and taking the scourge and uh, you know beating them and then of course the story where they misinterpreted you know is he gonna how's he gonna tear down the temple like with his hands right what a, what a cuckoo we know those stories what's well, important to recognize that they took place within the framework of Jesus visiting Jerusalem for the first Passover so we see him enter the courtyard we see him overthrow the tables and we also see this prophecy of his death burial and resurrection now again, this is the, uh, close to the very beginning of his public ministry, yet he's, in a sense he's already announcing the end, is he not? He's already announcing that he is going to be uh, slain, and he is going to uh, be you know, buried, and that he is going to rise again. Now interestingly, if you look with me in verse number 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name, when they saw the miracles which he did. So he had, he had some success in winning people to himself. In, in, you know, uh, as he had done earlier with his disciples, convincing them that he was truly uh, the, the awaited Messiah. Now, but, but again, notice the, the reason. Okay, Notice the reason. It says that they believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now we may, in a sense, we may kind of you know, look down on them, right? We may look down on them and say, well, they're only believing because of the miracles. But it's interesting when you study this out. Now, uh, today, um, we went to this passage, and I, I want to look at this passage. Um, <clears throat> the people, remember I said there, there was going to be this anticipation of Messiah. Well, one of the main points that they knew about Messiah was that he was going to come and do miracles, so those people weren't just, you know, just believing because there's these miracles. They're believing because they equated, here's this man doing the miracles, and the scriptures tell us that the Messiah, when he comes, will do the miracles. So I want you to look with me back in Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. And again, these are, uh, these are, these are messianic passages. We see, uh, and they are also millennial passages. Okay? They deal with Messiah, and they deal with events in the millennial era, or era of the millennium. Chapter 35, and I want you to look with me in verse number 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert, okay? These are things that the people associated with the coming of Messiah. So they go to Jerusalem and they see Jesus doing these things that the Messiah was promised, was foretold to do. And so they believed, not just, you know, there's a miracle, must be. no, this was a signal to them, a scriptural signal. So these people believed the word. It was a scriptural signal to them. But now I want, you to, I want you to look ahead also in Matthew chapter 11. 
Matthew chapter 11. And this is what I was mentioning was referenced today. Matthew chapter 11. And we'll be reading uh, beginning in verse number 4. Now let me set this context here. This is when John the Baptist has been imprisoned. He's, he's going to be beheaded shortly after. And John the Baptist has, we could say, maybe a crisis of faith. He's, he's confused. Now, we can get down on him, but we need to understand. If you remember, remember from our prophecy class? Do you remember that I gave you that uh, thing that showed what the prophets saw in the Old Testament? And they saw the coming of Jesus but they couldn't see that valley, right? They knew. They knew Messiah was coming, but they couldn't see that valley that's our era, the era of the church, the age of the church. And so they knew Messiah was coming. And so John the Baptist, as godly as he was, he, he didn't know about the church, and he didn't know about the thousands of years, and he didn't know other than Messiah was going to come. And so he looks and he says, this guy's been here a little while, and he hasn't set up the kingdom. It, he's, and he says, he says this, he says, art thou that one or look we for another? Right? He, wa he wanted to believe in Messiah and he's just not sure for a moment. Is this truly the guy? And let, let me say to you that to, this is such a powerful piece of scripture and such a powerful lesson, I believe, for you and I as believers. Because Jesus himself doesn't say something like, hey man, don't you trust me? Do you know what Jesus tells John? Look in the word. And look with me in verse number, uh, chapter 11, verse number four. Jesus answered and said unto them, go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. I find that so extraordinary. Jesus didn't appeal to himself. He didn't say, remember all that stuff, you know, all the things we talked about? Remember when you baptized me? He says, John, it's in the word. Is what I'm doing, is what you've seen from me, does it correspond with the word? My friends, everything in our life needs to be examined in the light of God's word. We can't, we can't trust a man. We can't trust the greatest of men. Don't put your faith in men. Don't put your faith in what men do. Look in the word of God and make sure what they say and what they do and what's going on in your life is matching up to the Word of God. And so, <clears throat> uh, we, we see this. We see that these people believed because the, the things that this man was doing, the things that Jesus was doing, lined up with what had been prophesied. Now, what happens in chapter 3? Well, he has a visit from a man named Nicodemus. Again, context, right? This is all taking place within that period of this feast. And so uh, it's during this time that Nicodemus approaches him. And we find that story in John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. Now we know Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Uh, teach you a little bit about Pharisees. There were about 6,000 Pharisees at that, at that time, okay? Now the Pharisees, there were no, you don't read back in the Old Testament and read about Pharisees, do you? Where did Pharisees come from? The Pharisees came from the period of time that the Jews, when they went to Babylon, right? When they left, when they, were, when they were removed, when they were taken by Nebuchadnezzar and taken to Babylon, they were taken away from the temple, which for, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years had been the center of their worship, the tabernacle and the temple. There was a priesthood, right, that went along with that. All of a sudden, they're in Babylon, there's no temple, there's no, you know, there's no priest, I mean, there's, there's none of the things that they were familiar with. So what begins to develop is the system of the synagogues. And the Pharisees were the teachers that began to study the scriptures and to offer these different commentaries, and they would go to the synagogues and they would get their lessons, 
course, they, they were more than just a place, a spiritual place. They became a social gathering place. But the Pharisees belonged to and developed within this synagogue system. Very importantly to remember, they were not priests. They were not Levites. They were not part of, you know, that Old Testament family uh, that was, you know, designated to take care of the services of the temple. On the other hand, the Sadducees, who were their enemies, right, were the priests. And they were, you know, they were the ones that the, the high priest would be, you know, a Sadducee. They were the ones associated with the temple. Well, after the return, you have this group, the Sadducees, who had been, you know, in the scriptures. And, and once they return and they begin to, you know, perform their operations again in the temple, well, you have this other group that grew up and gained power. And they begin, these two groups begin to conflict. And of course, uh, it's amazing. If you, if you Google sometime, it is amazing. I did this a few weeks ago. I was Googling some of the, you know, things that they disagreed upon. Some of them are, I mean, just, I mean, we know, like, you know, one believed in angels and the other didn't. One believed in the resurrection and the other. But some of the things that they differed on were just the absolute most ridiculous things that you ever uh, could even imagine that people would differ on. But over the centuries, they developed this, you know, kind of uh, rivalry, you might say, and they were, you know, very much opposed to one another. So, the, but, but we need to understand, in John chapter 3, this discussion with Nicodemus, the backdrop to the whole conversation is the Passover. That's why, that's why Jesus is there. That's why this is all going on. That's, you know, Nicodemus is looking and he's, you know, he's saying, you know, uh, I know you're a master of Israel. You know a whole lot of things. And I'm really confused about, you know, this, this whole thing. I mean, who are you? And so Jesus goes through and he talks to him about the new birth. Now, the Passover is related to the new nation, right? The forming of this nation, this Jewish people. Salvation is related to the new birth. And he talks to him about that new birth. And he presents himself literally as the Passover lamb. Now, you won't find that, you know, directly, I am the Passover lamb, but you find him saying, you know, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You find him saying, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the son of man must be lifted up. You see him making it clear that he is the one. I mean, he's not saying, you know, somebody's going to come one day. He's saying the, the son of man, the one who's standing in front of you, this, this is the one who will be offered for the nation. And we notice that, the, I, I want to go back just a second to, to John chapter 2. And we, I, I mentioned this slightly, but I want to mention this, this kind of curious commentary. Again, look at John chapter 2, uh, and where it says that many believed in his name when he saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. What, what is that? I mean, that seems a little convoluted. What is that about? Well, what we need to understand is, uh, this, this is not speaking in the sense of salvation. It, it, it is a simple question that it's not, he, he did not commit himself. It was not the moment for him to be offered as the sacrifice for the people, as a sacrifice for sin. Um, there's several times in the scriptures where Jesus, there's like a crowd that gets around him, right? And they're going to throw him off the cliff or they're going to do him in. And the Bible says that he just simply slipped away, right? And it says, because it, it was not the right time. And that's what this is meaning here. Okay, he, didn't, he didn't, you know, come out and just, you know, okay, this is the moment. Because he knew there's a couple more Passovers to come. He knew when that moment would be. And so he wasn't going to, you know, fully enact everything that was going to take place in that last Passover because it wasn't the moment. That's important for us to learn, isn't it, as believers? How many times have we done the right thing at the wrong moment? Huh? That's one of those things that, you know, that we, we just have to be, that's why we have to be so spirit sensitive. Because when we're not, we, we can get discouraged. I did this, but yeah, but God says, but it wasn't the right moment. I know in, in you know, in dealing with my children and helping them to grow, right, and that's one of the things we talked about many times, you know. Yes, it's the right thing, but is it the right moment? And so Jesus, he knew, you know, Hey, I'm going to give myself, and that's the right thing to do, and we, we should do it, you know, now's the right moment. Maybe it's not. So let's be careful. Let's be careful to be sensitive to the Spirit 
And not only sensitive to what he wants us to do, but sensitive to when he wants us to do it. And so that, that's, that's what that, you know, is meaning. It was, he was simply, at this time, not going to go through as the sacrifice. This was not the moment to become the Passover lamb. He was simply continuing to lay the groundwork for his ultimate presentation to the nation as the promised Messiah. Now, I want you to jump up with me nextly to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And we find here the second Passover. The second Passover. And if you'll look with me, verse number 4, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. We talked about this, uh, parts of this uh, chapter last week. It's, it's one of the longest chapters. It's a really long chapter. Um, but again, the background of the events that go on uh, are all related to the Passover. And this is the, uh, the, the, these first events that you see, events recorded in the area of Capernaum. And this is the feeding of, of the 5,000, okay? And again, last week as we examined this, as we looked at this um, moment, this feeding, we saw in verse number 32, if you'll look there with me, then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Okay? And so he, he's speaking of this bread that comes down from heaven. And then look with me as well in verse number 48. He says, I am that bread of life. Now again, this, this, this moment here, Talking about Passover, but I mentioned in many ways this spills over, does not, into unleavened bread. And of course, this is what uh, we're dealing with at this point. Now, Jesus used these analogies because of Exodus chapter 16. And let's turn to Exodus chapter 16. He's talking about the manna. He's talking about this bread of life. Exodus chapter 16. Again, these are, these are events that are well known to the people. We talked about the fact that, um, you know, during these festive seasons, during these holidays, they would, you know, sit around the table and they would discuss, you know, what took place and, you know, uh, what happened on the night of the Passover, what happened, you know, during this time that they were in the wilderness. And if you look here, uh, Exodus chapter 16 deals with, uh, remember the people were murmuring, right? He sends them the quail, and then shortly afterwards, they begin to get the manna. In verse number, uh, verse number 14, And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And that becomes their daily bread, right? That becomes their food that they're going to eat for the next 40 years. And if you remember, in one of our earlier lessons, we saw that the manna ceased. Who remembers what moment, what key moment, the manna ceased? Does anyone remember? They cross over into the Jordan, and they celebrate the Passover. Do you remember that? We talked about that. And we saw that was the, one of the second ones that was recorded. They celebrated in the wilderness, and they celebrated then again when they enter into the Promised Land, and it says right in that same portion of Scripture, and the manna ceased, okay? And so, you know, that, we know that represents, you know, uh, you know, the fact that you and I need to feed daily on that living bread, on that manna, on, on our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then look with me in Exodus chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. And again, we see here, uh, same idea, and it talks here about what, how the people, you know, they prepared the manna, what they did with the manna when they got it. And again, these, are, these, are, these were stories that people were very familiar with. They knew their history, and they, they you know, it was particularly, um, you know, talked about and retold and discussed at these different times of years, particularly during Passover, the events of the Passover night, and then unleavened bread, the things that took place in the wilderness and how God provided for them. And so uh, Jesus used these analogies, the true bread from heaven, that bread of life. I am that bread of life. And he used these analogies, just like I said to you a few minutes ago. 
Use the events, use the things going on, the holidays or the, you know, the, the things that are going on, the current events that are going on. Use them as we talk to people because that's what Jesus did. And so um, not only were these things that were going on, but how many of you, okay, and, uh, I hesitate doing this, how many of you grew up in the Catholic Church? Okay. Everybody knows what the reading is going to be for that week, right? You have your little missalette, and it has the reading from the scriptures. Well, remember earlier that I talked to you about the synagogue system. There were specific re re readings associated with this Feast of Unleavened Bread, and those readings came from Exodus 16 and Numbers, okay? So as Jesus is talking about the fact that he is this manna, he is this bread of life, the people are thinking about what they'd just been hearing in the synagogue. He was pretty good, wasn't he? And so, again, I encourage you, use those things, use those opportunities, use the, the current events and use the, you know, the, 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 I don't want to say festivals, but the holidays that we have to, to, to spiritual purposes. And then ask you to turn... Uh, we'll see the third Passover. We won't spend a lot of time in this. We, we've already looked at uh, that last evening, and we'll, we will discuss it a little bit further later. But we want to talk about the third and final Passover of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is, of course, uh, begins with his uh, <clears throat> triumphal entry into Jerusalem in, in John chapter 12, and it goes all the way through uh, chapter 20, uh, verse 31. So again... Um, you know, all of, the, all of those chapters, 12 to 20, are dealing with just a one-week period of time, the last week of Jesus' life. Yet it is, you know, a significant portion, again, probably a, a third or more of the Gospel of John. So the one week, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that he was spending all of his time in Jerusalem. It's just that's the focus of the scriptural narrative. So we see in John chapter 12, you look with me, in verses 12 and 13, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, again, the, feast, the Passover, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And of course, verses 14 and 15, direct quotes coming out of uh, Zechariah and elsewhere in the Old Testament. So this was clearly, people were signaling their belief that this was the Messiah. This was this Lamb of God. And don't forget, as we mentioned a few weeks ago, this is on that day. This is the day that the Lamb, the spotless Lamb, was chosen by each household, right? Uh, back in, in, on that Passover night, chosen and watched. And Jesus will be watched over the next few days to determine, is he pure? Is he healthy? Is he worthy? Is he truly the Lamb of God? And so, Nisan 10, and that's what's taking place at this point. Then chapters 13 through 17, all of those chapters deal with Christ in the upper room. And that's when we see Christ, he says, remember he says, go and prepare, get the room and go and, you know, get the, the, everything that's needed for the Passover meal. And they go and they have that meal. And then, of course, that's followed by the Lord's Supper. And then we see in chapters 18 through uh, chapter 20 and verse number 31, we see the story of Jesus' betrayal. We see his sufferings uh, and we see his death. Jesus literally becomes as we saw in John chapter 1 and verse 36, he becomes the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to finish up with this idea. I mentioned uh, in the very beginning themes that we find in the scriptures. And it's important to understand that that's not something that just pops up here and there. The theme of Christ as the Lamb of God, as this, you know, as the sacrifice is everywhere in the scriptures. I want you to look with me, first of all, in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Oh, but that's the end of the scriptures, not verse number 8. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. What? 
slain from the foundation of the world. So we have all the way back in, in time, from the very beginning, we have this picture of this lamb that's going to be slain. What do we see in the first couple chapters after Adam and Eve sin? Do we not see an animal sacrificed, its blood shed, uh, not only as the you know, sacrifice for their sin, but as the you know, picture, the image of the one who would come? Of course, we've spent the past few weeks discussing this lamb that would be uh, sacrificed by the Jewish people at their Passover and how that is, you know, it is absolutely, clearly a representation. We know, you know, sometimes we, we read through. How many times have you ever read through, uh, you know, uh, those books and, you know, they're talking about, you know, thousands of animals being offered some of these, you know, ceremonies or celebrations, the dedication of the temple, just just literal thousands and thousands of animals. You know, and sometimes we can get caught up in the fact that, you know, it just kind of numbs us, right? But in fact, every one of those was pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, we have in John chapter, uh, you know, in the beginning there, John chapter, um, uh, where do I have it? John chapter 1, verse 36, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. I want you to look with me in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. This theme goes through. You'll find it in many of the epistles, you know, mention of the, of the lamb that was slain or, you know, Jesus was a lamb that was taken before uh, those that would slaughter him. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 19. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without, spot, without blemish and without spot. Now, you know what's very interesting? We find, again, from, from, from before time, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. We see this theme continue all through the scriptures. But it's very remarkable. This theme does not disappear. If you look, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll ask you just to look in Revelation. I mentioned uh, ver chapter 13. And I didn't, I didn't write them all down. But if you look again at uh, chapter 13, it mentions... Uh, the book of life of the Lamb. What do you notice about that word lamb? It is capitalized. It is, it is referring to deity. And there's absolutely no question that it is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that we find L capitalized about 25 times in the book of Revelation? So, I mean, it's, it's, like, it's not like something that just kind of petered out after his sacrifice. In the, 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 the very end of the scripture, the final book, he is referred to again and again and again as the Lamb. Look with me in the, in the very last chapter. Chapter 22. And he showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on the other side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb. So this is not something that just appears in the Scriptures. This is not something that, you know, is over and done with. My friends, these are, this here, these, these verses are future, are they not? Jesus is in heaven will be the lamb. He will be that lamb that is, was sacrificed from the beginning, from the foundation of the, of the world. And so again, I, I want to emphasize, this is not a casual theme of the scriptures. It begins in the very beginning of the Bible, and we find it in the very end. And this theme of Christ, the Lamb, the, the Christ as our Passover Lamb. Christ as, you know, the Lamb who gave himself, shed his blood for us. Now, I know, I know it, it might, may sound trite, but we need to, we need to grasp the, the significance of it. He truly is the Lamb. And this theme of the Passover is not something that's just from, you know, a couple thousand years ago when the Jews did this one night. It is a critical and key theme, not only of all the scriptures, but in truth, all of history and all of eternity. 
And so as we read the scriptures, let's, let's try and keep those things in mind. As we come across that, let's try and, you know, maybe have a deeper understanding as we, as we, as we come across the Passover. As we look in some of these stories, that are, everyone knows the, the story of Nicodemus. But examine it in its historical light, in its contextual light. And understand, you know, I like to, don't you like to do this kind of, sometimes put yourself in the mind of the people, right? I mean, that helps us to understand. Put yourself in Nicodemus's place. And he's thinking about this. Is this that lamb? Is this the promised one? Think about all these events as you read through the scriptures. Put, put flesh and bones to them. Put life to them. And try and understand them, as I say again, in their scriptural context, in the, in the, in the historical and the religious and the cultural context in which they took place. And I guarantee you it will help you to see even more in the scriptures than you've ever seen before. All right? So, I don't know. Are we about done? It's about time to be done? I haven't looked at my... I've done a good job, haven't I? Um, next week, as I said, there's no class next week, okay? We're all clear on that. Enjoy. Have a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving. If you're traveling, be safe. Enjoy time uh, away with family or whatever. Uh, but do come back the following week. We'll move on to, uh, you know, jump into the, uh, talk a little bit about the first fruits, and then we'll be uh, speaking much more about unleavened bread. Again, we've, we've, we've been in and out of that. Remember, they, they're kind of a unit. They kind of go together. But there are some distinct things about it, and I think that there's some things as well that we can, that we can see in the scriptures that will, uh, that will be a help to us as we continue to try and learn more and see more about Jesus Christ in all of the Word. Let's pray before you go. Father, thank you so very much for your goodness. Thank you for your word, Lord. Uh, It it is such a wonderful book. And Lord, even even if we had the time to just look into it 24-7, Lord, we would only begin to touch the hem of the garment. But Lord, I just pray as we go from here today and as we go through our week and as we Continue our study in the coming weeks. Uh, Lord, may you just continue to reveal yourself through your word. Lord, reveal your, your beauty and your perfection, your holiness, your love for us. Lord, just help us as we, as we study it to see you as you are everywhere in it. Thank you for shedding your blood. Thank you for being our Passover lamb. Thank you that it didn't end there, but that we can feast upon you each day. We can eat of the manna. We can eat of the bread of life. And Lord, we can live fulfilled and happy and useful Christian lives because we're feeding and living upon you every day. Lord, give us a great week as we go into this week of Thanksgiving. I just pray, Lord, that we'll use this opportunity to share with others about why we're thankful, why we above all people should be people of gratitude. Help us as well with the time off to to get refreshment and encouragement. And Lord, I just pray that we would return here um, in love with you more deeply than ever before. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a lovely night. Thank you for coming. If you didn't get the the page that... uh,